Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. podcast. Today we have a good friend of the podcast, Cody Nelson, owner at the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix, the Optics Authority. Cody, how you doing? I'm doing good, Jake. Glad to to be here and uh, and we're back from hunts and and, uh, the season is in full swing around here. That's awesome. I know you just got off a hunt with uh, our good friend, uh, Cody Goff, which uh, you've been friends with Cody since you guys were, what, five, six, seven years old? Oh, like we're, I think we're working on about 40 years now. Game calls. Awesome. It looks like he got a nice buck. Tell me a little bit about it. He did. He uh, he and, and a buddy, uh, Brennan and Luke and myself and, uh, and Dan Palin, and um, those guys had been working and had found a buck earlier in the year uh, around the archery season. Now we're and, talking uh, coos buck, right? Yeah, talking coos deer. Um you know, uh, they, they had located him, you know, in, uh, in August and they had tried to, to get on him, uh, you know, with their archery tackle and, and, uh, they got close a couple times, but could never close the deal. And, uh, Cody was the first up with, uh, you know, with an October tag, uh, for that unit. And, uh, so it took us a couple of days to locate him and, 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 uh, and, and, and you know put the uh put the moves on him and and he gave us a slip one day and and then found him the second day again in the evening and on the third morning uh w- with a little bit of uh help and and a, a little glassers and and people in the right place we were able to put Cody in on him and uh and Cody made a perfect 300 and I think it was about a 325 yard shot and absolutely just pole axed him and uh it was yeah, I don't know. I think uh, Cody put a tape on him, and I I, I want to say it went right at 110. It was just an absolutely beautiful deer, and uh, could not have been happier with the hunt. Great group of people, great you know, great job by all, and and uh, it was a good deal. It was a f- very fun hunt, very warm. Yeah, it was hot. I was over with uh, Dar and his youngest son uh, Paul. <laughs> um, first question for you was they had located the deer in August. Uh, and then trying to find him prior to right prior to the season or right the first couple of days of the season, how far had the deer moved, uh, or was the deer with you know within a tight range circle of where they had the, seen him all summer? You know, Jay, the, the I, you know the deer don't you know they're so concentrated when they're in velvet on getting you know uh, getting uh, put the weight on and 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 feeding those antlers and and growing those antlers. Um, you know, they don't move around a lot. And so the truth of it is, is that the deer was within, um, you know, I think if you, I don't know, if you put a line of sight on it, I don't think the deer ever ventured more than, uh, you know, basically a half mile, you know, on either side of, and, and, and actually that's probably big, um, you know, it's probably a quarter mile on either side of, of where he was at, uh, originally. Yeah, and so when you guys were looking for him, trying to relocate him for the season, um, I I know a lot of people, I've been there a million times, where you try and overthink it, you try and second-guess yourself on, well, maybe he's moved. Um, Can you offer some advice to people out there that, you know, are are maybe new at cooster hunting as far as, it's been my experience, once you find a buck, Unless it's during the rut, you have a pretty good chance to sit on the same rock or the same vantage point and glass that buck up over and over and over. Um, Certainly, there may be glassing points that are better than others, uh, but their home range is very tight. Um, Just wondering if you have any elaboration on that. Well, I I do. Um, First of all, what you said is absolutely 100% accurate. Uh, I'm not saying they can't move. I'm not saying they won't move. I'm just saying that my experience has been, you know, over the last 25 years is that when you find a buck, especially when it's a non-rut situation, meaning that it's in August or it's in, um, you know, in that early October hunt or the youth hunts, um, flat out period, if you find a deer, my first place to go back to and look at and keep looking at will be where I spotted the first time. And I would almost tell you that, uh, um, I don't know, with, within a couple hundred yards uh, of where I first spotted deer is where we'll find that deer again. Almost 
almost without a doubt. Yeah, I I agree. I I even go as far as saying, you know, with coos deer, I've seen it where if you if you find them in a certain open yellow patch or, or you know, by a certain tree, that if you sat there long enough and you just keep watching that spot, eventually they're going to show up in the exact same spot where you've seen them. They absolutely uh, will. Coos deer are so habitual. You know where you contrast that with uh, bighorn sheep. Uh, you know, I always say that the worst place to look for a, a bighorn ram is the last place you saw them. Right. They tend to go all over the place and never stay in one spot. And, uh, I mean, sure, they have, you know, travel corridors and places that they, they frequent, but they never seem to be in the same spot. I think that's one really cool thing about coos deer is, you know, it's, it's difficult. If they were very nomadic, like, like a desert bighorn, I think people would have way less success than they do. I mean, I already think they're one of the hardest animals to hunt because of their size and the terrain that they live in and how well they blend in. But can you just imagine if they were nomadic and, and never, you know, basically were here and, you know, 20 miles away in three days, uh, you know, trying to pattern them would be Unbelievably it, it, I, I, it would be almost, it would be daunting to, I, I, I you know, would almost use the word impossible. Yeah. Cody, it, I know you guys have been busy um, down there um, at the Outdoorsman's. I know you've got your big ultimate gear giveaway going on. Um, it's had to generate a lot of phone calls and, and a lot of activity. What is what is going on with this ultimate three package uh, give, gear giveaway? Yeah, it, it's uh, and and just so everybody knows, October thirty first is the you know the last day that you can sign up, and uh, you know we're giving away an X five rifle scope with you know with a custom turret. Uh, we're doing a long range glassing or I'm sorry, a long, a long range backpack, uh, accessory pod, vinyl harness, glassing pad, and a rain cover on one package. And then we're doing an outdoorsman's tripod, adapters, and, and the head of your choice. Um, so those are, you know, it, it's generated an absolute ton of, uh, of response, and, and we've got a lot of people calling and asking about stuff. And, and there's just a, you know, and, you know, it's not often that we get, you know, um, everybody involved like this. And Swarovski was really happy to, to, uh, to, to jump on board, and, and we wanted to do something good and, uh, so uh, we figured an X5 scope would be a great way to to uh, to get some energy and and get some people excited about a gear giveaway. That X that Swarovski X5 scope, um, how does it uh, compare with some of their uh, older products that have been coming out over the last? you know, 10, 15 years, what upgrades, well, what, what do you I, see different with the X5? Jay, the, the X5 is really, it's a long range hunting scope that was basically built with the mind of competing with the likes of the Night Force and Schmidt and Benders and, and some of the more quote unquote tactical long range shooting scopes. Um, and, and it was literally built from scratch. It was about a seven year project and and they, there is nothing on that scope that was not thought about, and 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 done. And I can tell you that you know from sitting behind you know the Night Force and U.S. Optics and some of the likes, the glass is the glass is just flat out better. Um, it doesn't mean that some of those other products don't work. It just means that this product works and it works. Are you well. talking about the optical quality, Cody? I'm talking I mean, about the optical quality is as good as it gets, and it's better than it's better than anything that I've looked through. Um, I mean, you know, it, it's I, I, I had the opportunity to shoot the X5 and, and some Night Force scopes um, at a shooting school in Texas, and and without a doubt the uh, what I like to call the eye box, which is basically the eye relief and how you get behind the scope, um, flat out was was more enjoyable to look through and 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 was absolutely better quality. Um, doesn't mean that you know the other scopes didn't work. It just what it meant to me was is that I finally got the optical quality that I that that I demand with the the uh, you know the exactness uh, of a long range scope. That's exactly what it meant for me. Nice. Um, I, I assume the light gathering capability is phenomenal. Yeah, it's, you know, it's quality. Swarovski always has that. 
you know, just that wow factor. And that's exactly what it brought to the long range hunting scopes. Awesome. So you guys are giving one of those away. What do people have to do to sign up for the gear giveaway? Uh, it's real simple. Uh, go to outdoorsmans.com forward slash giveaway, and uh, and it'll take you right to it. And you, you put your name and email in there, and and uh, and we will uh, we'll do the drawing after this uh, October 31st and, and start letting people know. Awesome. Cody, I I wanted to do a podcast here uh, with you and answer some of the listeners' uh, questions that have come in. And I thought you would be a perfect guest to have on to talk about some of these uh, questions and answer some of these questions. Sure. Uh, First one is from Scott uh, Simmons. Uh, I was listening to your podcast with Cody from The Outdoorsman's. I'm getting ready to get the Swaro 95 spotting scope and was wondering why you prefer, I think he's meaning why Jay prefers the straight version. I'm a pretty tall guy at 6'5", and I know you're tall as well, and I was all set on the angled. Just curious, as a taller guy, what makes you go with the straight version? Thanks for the great podcast. I never miss an episode. I'm up here in Las Vegas. I just got back from a Unit 32 coos hunt um, and decided it's time to get a better spotter. Um, Pretty good question. I'm sure, Cody, it comes up with you. Jay, it's it's probably, when you talk about spotters, it's probably the number one question that gets asked. And before I say this, um, and you and I have had this discussion many a times, and we both feel the same way, before anybody questions, I made myself for an entire year, an entire year of hunting, spring, fall, what didn't matter when I went, I forced myself to use a, 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 an angled spotting scope. I'm not saying I didn't get good with it. I'm not saying that it, it's not quality, and I'm not saying that nobody should do it. But when when you are hunting and when you are in a situation where target acquisition is everything, there is nothing that is faster and more efficient than, than a straight tube spotting scope. So when you say target acquisition, um, you're talking about when you're looking through your binos and you spot whatever it is that you want to look at closer yep. with your spotting scope, and you switch from your binoculars to your spotting scope on your tripod. So you, you've acquired your target, whatever it may be, and you are popping the binos off and putting the spotting scope on. You're saying that your target acquisition, meaning being able to go from binos to the spotting scope and be looking through the spotting scope at the animal, you feel like finding that animal with the spotting scope through a straight is by far faster. Absolutely. Without a question, no, it's, it's not even a a contest for me. And I will agree with that. I've always used a straight, uh, spotting scope. And I, when I got the 95 millimeter, uh, Swarovski, the 30 to 70 eyepiece and the 95 millimeter objective, um, I, I was, I still am really into digiscoping and taking photos. And I thought that having the angled lens because of the downward pressure on the eyepiece, uh, whether I'm using, uh, you know, my big camera lens, my Swarovski, uh, TLS APO adapter, uh, or the phone scope, uh, 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 Digiscoper or the Outdoorsman's Digiscoper, whichever one I'm using, the downward pressure on that angled lens I thought would be better to be more secure. And it may be the case, but what I found, and it, a lot of it probably was due, due to the fact that I've always used a, a straight spotting scope, I couldn't find, I would, I would have right in the center of my binos a buck and I would want to go and put my spotting scope, Cody, and I would get the, the angled spotting scope up, and it took me forever to Jay, find even, the animal. And then as yep. an animal got bigger, 
or there was more anticipation of I need to get on it right away, it, it made worse. it even worse. <laughs> and then you start panicking, and I'm like, okay, well, after, you know. I think, Jay, that and, and the reason that I, I made the comment about, you know, I, I literally forced myself to use a, an angle for a year because I wanted to be able to talk you know, talk to talk with anybody who calls. And I'm not saying that there's never a place for an angled spotting scope. I don't, I don't, there are some situations. Yes. If you're sitting on a flat desert floor and you're looking straight up, I will absolutely tell you that an angled spotting scope, technically speaking, is more comfortable. I I do not mind, you know, tilting my head down and looking at that. that, That's not even the point. When it, it just when it comes to hunting for me and it comes to target acquisition, th- there's a couple things that I'm going to touch on here real quick that we haven't yet. Jay, when when you switch from your binos to or your binoculars to a spotting scope and you have an angled spotting scope, you have to change the position of your of your tripod, which means you have to lower it because the, the, the angle technically sits taller and angles up, so now you have to lower your center post or lower your legs or or literally move yourself away from the tripod and get up on top of it, so to speak. And at all the time that you're doing that, you are wasting time while that animal you know is, is either maybe he's moving, maybe he, you just caught a glimpse of him. It, it's not just about the the awkwardness of looking at something and then just knowing where your spotting scope is supposed to be because I got pretty good at doing that after a year I could look at a spot on a mountain and kind of you know I could eyeball it and kind of you know instinctively put it there but it was never ever ever as fast as a straight one coming from my binoculars and going to a straight tube the the gear that we use and and all this the stuff that we do um, in, in preparation is to make sure that when we slide our binoculars off and slide the spotting scope on, you should relatively be looking at the same field of view. Yeah, and I I think you made a great point there. You said you had to lower the legs or raise the legs. You had to lower the center post. And for me, I just cringe because I always like to leave my binos on what I'm looking at and I even tighten it down just a little bit so that yep. it's pretty rigid. Yep. Then I pop the binos off and I slide in on, you know, the outdoorsman's, uh, ad- you know, the adapter. Yeah. Slide in, slide out, slide in, and I should be looking right at the same spot. Now, if you start having to adjust legs or adjust the center post, now you have. I mean, you've totally changed the angle. You've totally changed. So, and I'm just telling, and from my perspective, when you add the heat of the situation, and you're on your hunt, and there's a big buck, and you're, you know, you're excited. Oh my goodness, you want to talk about panic? Well, um, and then you know, and and how bad you feel if you're helping somebody, or you know, in Jay, in the cases that you know we've been on on quote unquote guided hunts. And you got a client, and and you're telling the, you know, you're telling you or, well, I thought I had him. Well, that, you know, that's, you know, that's, I mean, it's not real good for the client to hear that part of it. I mean, even though yeah. everybody might be understanding, but we all know. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I just know that there's a better, cleaner way to do it and more efficient, so that, that you know, I'm getting back on target immediately. Right now. What's what I find interesting with the angled and the straight is you you still sell a bunch of angled. Yeah, we and look, and, and mean, there's people that love angled. Yep, there's there, there are there are, are are and I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that that will still buy an angled and and I always they always ask me the question, well, Cody, what do you you know what do you suggest? What tell me why or why not? I've always had the, you know the question, but. Some people just buy the angle because that's what their buddy told them to buy. And, you know, and we do. We we hear the question literally once a day, at least. And it, it just, it all comes back to me is, is I answer the question basically just like we just talked about. And, but I'm not telling someone that, you know, I've had people call up and say, well, I got a bad neck. Look, 
if 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 a certain piece of gear works best for you then that's okay then use it and you know if you've got a you know a bad neck or you've got a back injury i mean we're not trying to change you you know but but people call and they ask your opinion and you know jay when it's i think you and i had this conversation about a week ago and i don't mean to use when it's kill time when you're hunting and you've put all the thousands of dollars and all the time and all the stuff into something, and it's t- and it's go time. I, I don't want to be messing around with a, 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 a bunch of inefficient ways. That g- I want to get it done. I I need the I need the target in my scope or in my you know field of view now. Because what if that deer decided to bed down and no one saw him again? What if the deer you know went through a saddle and never saw him again? I mean, there's. I mean, there could be a hundred things that that deer does that that you know makes you miss him, and then now you can't find the deer, and it happens. Yeah, so. for sure. I I think another thing too, um, and I'm curious to get your opinion. Um, when people are out using their equipment and say they they've got new equipment or it's equipment they've used for years or even at the beginning of the season or say the beginning of the trip when the heat is not on i think it's very important to to have your tripod set up have your binos on um i've all, i've used the outdoorsman's bino adapter forever and i believe it's the best on the market yes the outdoorsman sponsors this podcast but i've been using the outdoorsman's bino adapter before the outdoorsman's was sponsoring this podcast so uh, my point is when the heat's not on, get your binos out and look at a rock or a tree or something that you can say, okay, that's my center of focus right there. Now I'm going to pop my spotting scope and slide the binos out, pop the spotting scope on. And when you pop the spotting scope on, whether it's angled or straight, you need to be able to slide it on there and have it be aimed and have your clips you know, that, that, that the, the outdoorsman's clips, the bogan clips, whatever clips you're using, you have to have those angled in such a way that it lines up. And for me, I think even people that have straight spotting scopes, their clip is off to a, a you know, yep. cr- crooked angle. And they look and they're 30 degrees to the left or 30 degrees to the right. Yep. And I think if you can get your clips, get everything lined up so that as soon as you pop your binos off and you p- quickly pop your spotting scope on, that you're looking in the same spot. And and I think that's a huge tip for people out there yeah. to get everything lined up correctly. Well, Jay, I think, you know, you were a college golfer. I was a college baseball player. And we've probably heard this you know, a million times. You practice like you play or you play like yep. you practice. Yeah. And the bottom line is, is that, and and you know, you, you can we have fun when we go out and we're scouting and doing all that, but but the way that I scout and the way that I glass when I scout is is no different than the way that I glass, you know, when when it's when it's game time, when it's the real deal. And sure, so if I, you're not yeah. making those little adjustments and you're not learning and you're not you're trying to get better and trying to be more efficient and trying to make sure that everything's lined up, well. Um, people, Jay, I know they ask you all the time, well, you know, Jay, how do you kill this? How do you, how, it's because those little things at the end of a hunt, if you took, took them all and totaled them up, they add up to something. They absolutely do. And that's something do. typically is the difference between harvesting and not harvesting, period. Absolutely. It's the little things that I, I, I truly believe. Uh, you know, some of the guys out there that are better than others, uh, they, a lot of them have a lot of the same skills, but it comes down to the little things and it comes down to the details and it, you know, it comes down to timing. Um, and, and that's what separates a lot of times a successful harvest and, and, you know, not, not successfully harvesting something for sure. Uh, Cody, let's take a quick break here. I'm super happy to announce that the Go Hunt Insider has just launched the newest Insider State, Oregon. Every state is different when it comes to units, draw process, and regulations, and Oregon is one of the most complex states to figure out. 
Like other states, you'll have the Go Hunt Insider filtering 2.0 to decide where to apply and hunt with filters for trophy potential, harvest success, weapon type, season dates, and a lot more. Oregon has 10 big game species and covers a total of 67 units. You will not only get an analysis of units, subunits, and seasons, but also species breakdown with the interactive graphs, plus a state profile that outlines how to apply and fees associated with applying in Oregon. Go to gohunt.com forward slash jscott to sign up and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card just for signing up. I have known the owners of the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix for over 20 years. They are the authority on optics and hunting gear. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods, mounting accessories, and pack systems for all hunters. Their customer service is the best in the business. Go to Outdoorsman's.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any products. Okay, Cody, one more thing back to Scott's question. You know, he says he's a pretty tall guy at 6'5 and was all set on the angled. To me, I don't think it, I mean, I, from what I gather, what I'm gathering by his 6'5 comment is that he's standing behind a tripod yeah. and glassing, and then he's using a spotting scope. Yep. But to, to me, I, I honestly don't know what being tall or being vertically challenged has to do with with the equation. Did you, did you, just, equation. Did you just say vertically challenged? I take great offense yeah. to that, Jay. <laughs> no, hey, Jay, I think what – look, to me it doesn't matter whether a guy's six foot ten or, you know, five foot six. It, it doesn't matter. It's, I mean, I, I, I would say this um, – I'm not telling a guy he can't stand. I'm tell, not telling a guy that he should never stand. I'm not telling a guy that there isn't situations that standing isn't you know warranted. Maybe you're in a place where there was a fresh burn and you got all kinds of vegetation or whatever. I mean, there's there's always situations where that happens. However, as a general rule, we always teach keep the tripod as low as possible, as stiff as possible, and whether he's six foot five or not, you know, that person can easily, you know, sit down and have a straight spotting scope within his, his range. Yeah. So, yeah. um, you know, again, aside from him saying that he's, you know, I know a guy that's, you know, had back surgeries and we, we have people that come in all the time and say, I, I just, I can't sit like that for hours on end. Well, okay. I get it. You know, you got to, again, you got to make the situation, you know, benefit you. Uh, but in general, uh, I, I, you know, if, he, if he's in normal condition and, and he doesn't have any, you know, uh, circumstances that make him stand, I would tell anybody, you know, get the, get the tripod low, get the optics low. Um, you know, exponentially, the, 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 the taller you go with the tripod and optics, the more, uh, the more they're going to shake and, and not be still and quiet. Yeah, and I would even further that to say, I understand the guys that can't sit a long time and they have to stand to glass. But if you're not in that situation, sit down and be still. And and you know, very few people can stand for long periods of time being as still as you need to be and being as precise as you need to be. And right. you know, I I think being an avid coos deer hunter and training my eye to you know, my game eye to fine game. And, and, you know, I've, I've grown up, you know, hunting coos deer and I, 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 I love glassing for coos deer and it's helped me so much when I go hunt all these different animals. Um, you know, maybe you can stand and glass for elk because, you know, it's like looking for a Volkswagen bug out there on the side of the hill, but for you coos deer hunters out there and for you guys that are, you know, bighorn sheep hunters that are, you know, looking long distances and mule deer hunters, uh, sit down, get down. Cody makes a great point of getting as low and as stable as possible. You know, I see it all the time. I'm out in Cooster country and there's a, you know, 30 year old guy or 25 or 35 year old guy and he's upstanding at, you know, glassing. And I, I don't care. I know there's great glassers out there that can glass no matter what. But overall, in general, guiding people, 
when people are stand-up glassers, they do not see as much game as the person that sits well, down, gets comfortable, and is stable, has every, you know tripod stiff like Cody says, and you know the platform is as stable as possible. Jay, I think the other thing too is, is that what what I always seem to now I know we might be talking about different yardages, but I I kind of think it's a little bit funny. I, I saw it this weekend when you're out there glassing and you look over on a ridge. There's a guy standing literally on the top of the, I mean the tallest point of the ridge standing up. And if I can see him at the distance that I'm looking through, if a deer is even half the distance, or what if the deer's on the same? I mean, what I don't understand is that some guys just stand up there and skyline themselves, I mean, as big as can be. And, you know, I guess it just depends on what distances you're glassing and hunting and whether you think there's deer around you or not. But I just think it's a, in general, I think it can be a bad practice. Cody, that led me to think of something else. Um, it's one of my pet peeves. Let's just talk about it. Um, <laughs> I see pictures all the time of guys glassing with the handle that they're using towards them. And then maybe it's just the way I do it, and maybe I do it wrong. But I, how do you not glass with the handle on the outside? So in other words, if you're sitting and you're looking, you know, you're looking forward and you're looking through your binoculars, how your hands come up, how can you not naturally have the handle on the outside? Now, I'm not picking on anybody in particular, and maybe everybody has their different ways of doing it, but I just don't see how tucking your hand in tight by your jaw is as smooth as having your hand naturally the way it bends come up and be on the outside of the binos. You know, Jay, if, if look, if you look at all the, here's, here, here's my thoughts on that. When you look at all the equipment that we use and, and I'm not at the moment, I'm not talking about the outdoorsman's gear. I'm talking about like Manfrotto and, you know, gets, you know, some of the bigger like quote unquote video tripod heads. Okay. I understand that if you're looking through a monitor and you and, and you've got a big arm that that is giving you and, I, and 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 those arms are there for a reason and they do make them more smooth and you know there's a whole you know uh, 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 fulcrum point that's you know giving you some leverage and and smoothness to your to your view, but we're not using big giant cameras on these things. We're using small binoculars with your face right up close to them. So for me, um, I, I, my, the handles of everything to me, whether it's a video head, a 701 HTV, you know, the new 502s, whatever, um, I'm at the point now where I, it, it, all handles go forward. That's just the I, it, it to me it's the most natural position to do it, and I'm also big, you know, chested and barrel chested, so. When I get my face up to the binoculars, there's not enough room to run a handle between me and the binoculars. I mean, it would. I mean, I, I don't even know if my arms would bend that way. And so, do, do, do you I, cringe I just, at all when you see the same photos that I see? And and I, you know, maybe they've tried both ways and they like that better. I would like to maybe hear from some people on how they like to do it. But yeah. it's like, I just don't see that being practical. And, and and the most efficient way to do it and to be able to do it for a long, long period of time. Um, but I see it over and over and over. And I think, man, Jay, you, you must just be, you must just do things weird because it seems like there's a lot of people that do it with the handle facing them. I've even seen it where like the handles going back behind their head and they're like, you know, their <laughs> hand is back by their ear. And I'm thinking, golly, what? And you know, maybe I think they get a tripod and they've never seen it, so they just start doing it one way, and that's you know the way they've learned. Um, and you know, I'm yeah, I'm an ex golfer, and I know that there's a million ways to swing the golf club. But to me, uh, you know, it's it's like someone that wants to play cross-handed golf. Yeah, you can do it, but man, there's a whole lot of reasons why doing it the the way that 99% of other people do it yeah. is better. Well, I, I don't think that, the, you know, that, that they're creating, 
you know, they're they're not recreating the wheel or reinventing the wheel if if that's you know what they're trying to do. Some people maybe it's because they don't know, maybe it's because no one's ever told them. And you know, the the happy part that I love, uh, you know, the the most impressive part of that whole deal is is that you know what, as long as guys are using glass and they're putting it on a tripod, they're they're bettering their odds. But um, you know, for me personally, you know, the learning and the teaching and the and the understanding doesn't stop there. So yeah. regardless of the equipment, I am always trying to figure out a better way to make it work more efficiently for, you know, and I guess maybe that's why I'm, you know, a diehard glasser and I love finding game. I mean, I, I, Jay, I, I, again, I've, I've said it on the podcast before. I love finding game more than I like killing it. Speaking so, of finding game, back to Scott's question. He, he mentions at the end he just got back from a Unit 32 coos hunt. And I can't help but read 32 coups and think of China Peak and Deer Creek <laughs> and, you know, Sombrero Butte and Redfield Canyon and, yes, sir. you know, uh, Powers Garden and, you know, Parsons Grove Rattlesnake. and Rattlesnake and just some of the, the old Turkey historic, Creek. just beautiful Turkey Creek and Four Mile and yep. um, golly, that's just some awesome country there and the Galeros and I know, Cody, you've spent a lot of time down there. Um, just an awesome place. I mean, from the rich history to the, you know, the, the, the Galeros mountain range, um, and the Winchesters there in unit 32 or it's just a neat place. Don't you yeah, think? I, 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 uh, it's, if I had to pick one place for myself that's down South and some people would, would, uh, you know, would say that, you know, South of I-10 is, is, truly down south and and i i don't disagree but if i had to pick one unit and it wasn't you know by my you know close to my house i would pick unit 32 every time all the time um not not i mean it's got a uh, it's got a lot of history it's it's got a uh, i mean there's big bucks in the unit there's sheep there's mule deer quadamundi there's you know I, I mean, there's, there's, you know, a couple different kinds of quail, and there's probably some scaled quail over there too. But there, I just love the area. Period. Um, I, I just, I, I have fond memories there, and I could, if you told me you wanted to go hunt there tomorrow, I, I would go down in a heartbeat and wouldn't even think twice about it. I love, love the country. I remember when you uh, went down with Dark our mutual friend Stephen Ranella with the meat eater oh, yeah. um, down there and, and helped him on his uh, first coos deer hunt. Uh, you know, to me still that, that episode with you and him down there in the, in the yellow grass and some of the beautiful mesas and just the, that country, it still stands out to me as one of those episodes of, of, you know, that will always stand out as, as, it, it's, just an incredible place. It's kind of fun, Jay, because I get you get people that come in the shop all the time, and they're like, "Hey, hey, you're 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 the guy that was with Steve on that deal," and and you you, you kind of laugh about it, but you know, we, it was such a fun hunt, and those guys were so willing to learn. And you know, here we were. We, you know, I was just happy to be along and 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 you know, give them any kind of knowledge that I could just to get them started because. All I did with them is go spend, you know, we basically spent a couple days glassing, and then those guys literally, you talk about getting out and doing it on their own, they, you know, they left the trucks and left everything behind, and they went and did what they do best, and, uh, you know, I I can't think of a better place for a guy to to truly, in one of those, you know, and, and Steve, you know, he loved this term when I brought it up. But the term Sky Islands, it, you, you can't, I don't know. I mean, you go to Unit 33 and 31 and 32, and you take those Sky Islands and those big mountain ranges, and I, I just don't know if there's anything that speaks coos deer more to me than that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and it, it was and a pleasure being with those Scott, guys. And, yeah, by Sky Island, for those listening that don't know what that means, I mean, uh, truly, you have, you know, desert flats, and then all of a sudden, as you're driving to these places, off in the distance, you see these purple mountains, and they just look like a, a sky island. They just, like, yeah. 
islands in the sky and then all of a sudden you get closer and closer and closer and here's these mountains that you know some of them go up to you know eight nine thousand feet in some cases the catalinas and you know it, it it's uh it's pretty neat southern arizona has it's pretty special i think compared to a lot of places around the country and the world in that you know you have such vast terrain you know going from desert floor to you know, pine tree at the top, you know, it's crazy. It, sh- it should be pretty noted, too, that, um, you know, most people don't probably realize this, but, you know, you take a central Arizona unit, and, and when I say that, I mean 21, 22, 23, 24A, B, 6A, uh, 6A you know, um, you take those units, and when a guy tells me that he goes out in glasses in the morning and he saw, you know, 10 to 15 deer, that's a pretty good morning. And I think when a guy goes out to some places in, in southern Arizona, 15, 10 or 15 deer, that might be a really, really slow morning. Yeah. I mean, there's there's places where you can go down south, and, and I haven't hunted down south truly in, in a few years now, but, but there's places that, that, you know, when we used to go down south, I mean, you know, it'd be a 50 to 60, 70 deer a, a, a morning or at least a day. Yeah. So the deer numbers it's, are much, much, you know, much more dense down there than they are in central Arizona. And uh, and so, you know, and, and by that, there's an attraction to southern Arizona because, you know, there's a ton of action and people are glassing and and uh, people are constantly in deer. And, and I mean, it's, I, again, it's a, it's a different, kind of a hunt but it it's fun i mean talk yeah, about glass there's paradise real game calls featuring the elk reel real game calls makes innovative realistic and easy to master calls using their proprietary revolutionary design They are located and manufactured in Gypsum, Colorado. Their calls were designed and battle-tested on some of the hardest hunted terrain on earth. Check out elkreel.com. Use the promo code JSCOTT and receive a 20% discount on all purchases. Go to www.elkreel.com. Phonescope is a company that makes custom-molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. It is simple to text photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. Phonescope stands behind their product with a 100% money-back guarantee. Get yours now by using the JSCOTT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at Phonescope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com, or on Instagram, at Phonescope. Yeah, for sure, that yellow grass and the contrast between the, you know, the yellow grass south slopes and the, you know, the oaks, the dark, dark, uh, exactly. what I call the dark timber, the dark oaks on the north side. Yep. Um, and then you've got, you know, your desert ocotillo, mesquite, you know, it's just, it's just, I love it, uh, you know. I agree. The, the the country that the coos deer inhabit to me is is you know one of the things that makes me love those coos deer and coos deer hunting so much. Um, Cody, tell me about the twenty uh, fifth uh, annual Swarovski sale that they're having. Oh uh, um, yeah, Swarovski is uh, is running a sale that started uh, you know on the first of October, and. Um, they are running a sale through December 31st, and it's uh, it's the SLC products, which is the you know the 842, 1042, and 1556 SLCs. Um, they are uh, they also have a sale on the EL ranges, 842s and and uh, and 1042s, and then they have a sale running on their uh, Z5, Z6, Z6i and X5 and X5i rifle scopes. Um, you know, and the savings, uh, really, I mean, I mean, we're talking in some cases $300, um, I mean, which is, you know, which is a really good savings. Um, and Strosky does not do this all the time. And, uh, and so I can't, you know, begin to tell you how good of a deal this is. I mean, there, there's some really good deals to be had out there. Uh, the, for instance, the 15s, uh, 15 by 56 SLCs, 
Uh, now we're talking the brand new, the the new ones that just came out within like the last year. Yep. The new 15s the are new on 15s sale. The new 15s are are they are 19.99, uh, and they were 22.99. So, um, you know, there's a $300 savings, and then uh, and just to make the deal a little sweeter for them. Um, uh, I, I will. Swarovski doesn't send out a, uh, a, a bino adapter anymore, so um, I will. I will give them one of our studs, and and uh, all they need after that is one of our bino adapters, and they're good to go. Awesome! I'm sure the phones have been ringing off the uh, hook, it's, and it's been it's been insane. Um, people are really taking advantage of the sale. Um, we, uh, God, we've been buying 15s. Like, I mean, I, 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 I can't keep them in stock. Um, Just, I've got, I, I find, I got another good shipment of them here and, and, uh, but we literally have not been able to keep stuff in stock. It's been going so fast. So, uh, wh- whatever I would tell people is, is do not let this sale slip through your fingers. Cause, uh, it's, uh, it, you know, a $300 savings is a $300 savings period. Yeah, I mean, I don't remember Swarovski ever doing sales like this, and they you know, I'm, I'm I'm partial to Swarovski. I've used them for 20 years, and every pair of optics that I have, except for the big Koas, the 32 power uh, Koa Highlanders, every pair of optics I have is is Swarovski, and I've been fortunate to go back to Austria three times, and I've been to the factory, and um, just a super uh, classy company. Um, supports hunters and uh, you know they're a huge company you know a billion dollar like a, I think five billion dollars in sales uh, with their crystals and all oh, yeah. the jewelry and stuff they make but they support hunters and so I think it's pretty awesome that a company that's that big uh, you know is not afraid one bit to step in and they've been a part of the hunting arena for you know 25 years now and uh, they're a strong supporter of hunting and um, yep. super high quality optics and uh, anybody that's looked to a pair of Swarovskis knows what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Speaking so, of which, Jay, um, you know, I would urge people to get on the uh, outdoorsman's Facebook page or Instagram page and, uh, and look at, you know, a, a, a digiscoping picture that I took with our, you know, digiscoper. And, you know, if, if got if, if people are, are into digiscoping at all, the that that 95 millimeter spotting scope, Jay. I I, I just I, I'm not even trying to make this a commercial about Swarovski, but I mean the, the picture that's on that page that that's 2,000 yards. Yeah. And that's through my iPhone. And yeah. I mean, just to get kind of images like that and have that picture, and I was able to send that to Cody. Um, you know, because he had he had had a bunch of pictures of him in velvet, and now we got pictures of him hard horned, and 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 obviously we you know we were very fortunate enough to harvest the deer. Um, I just think it's just the coolest thing to kind of ha- it just tells a story, and uh, and 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 to have that kind of optics and and be able to take pictures like that. Um, the truth of it is, is that you know we have the gear and we we have the capability to do it, so why not? Why not? Yeah, I love my. 30 to 70 eyepiece with that 95 millimeter, that Swarovski, you know, it, it's heavy. I won't, I won't lie. It's, it's a big piece of glass, but it's the quality with that. When you crank up to 70 power, it's, it's awesome. Um, it, it's mind blowing, I, you know, and I had the 20 to 60 eyepiece before that with the 85 millimeter, I believe the STS. And, uh, I just love my 95 millimeter. It's awesome. Yep. Cody, it's been great having you on. As always, uh, just wish you the best through this fall, and, and uh, thanks for coming on and sharing your knowledge as always here with us. Hey, Jay, I, I wanted to give you uh, maybe the podcast listeners a heads up. Um, the Outdoorsman's is uh, we are very close to uh, launching a uh, what's going to be a monthly newsletter, and uh, I think people will be very excited to uh, to be a part of this. Um, and it will be information and stuff that will be very useful to them. Um, it will be available. They can sign up for it on our website. Um, but I think people will really, really like this, and uh, it will uh, it'll allow them to see some things that uh, we do here at the Outdoorsman's and uh, things that make uh, us unique and the information that we give unique. And so uh, just, uh, I don't know, I just kind of put it out there and, 
and letting people uh, know that it's coming, and uh, I can't wait to get it live, and we're we're just about ready to kind of let that go here pretty quick. So uh, just keep your listeners uh, uh, up to date and, you know, just let them know what's coming. So Sounds good. Uh, outdoorsmans.com. So they can go sign up for the newsletter on outdoorsmans.com. Yep, it's it it'll be live here in a couple of days, and uh, and I don't know when you're gonna put this one out, but we'll uh, I know you'll get this out pretty quick. But um, we're yeah we're we're uh, we'll we'll start doing that here pretty quick. Awesome, thanks for having you on. Thanks for uh, coming on, and well, always absolutely. glad to have you on, buddy. Um, and can't wait to see some of your next adventures and uh, I'll see you down at the shop one of these days. Okay. You got it, bud. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, bud. Guys, thanks for listening and supporting my podcast. If you would, please go on iTunes and leave me a comment and leave me a five-star rating. That helps our placement on iTunes. If you'd like to send me an email, you can at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. You can also follow along our adventures at jscottoutdoors.com, also on Instagram or Facebook. I'd like to thank my sponsors for supporting this podcast, GoHunt.com Insider, PhoneScope, The Outdoorsman's, and Real Game Calls.